weekly gathering, I'm Reverend Ingrid Brown, and I'm the minister at Weird Church. I'm a first-generation settler on this land with Latvian and German heritage, and I was raised on Next Leilikwem, which is otherwise known as Bowen Island, which is in the Squamish territory. Weird Church is a place of belonging. It's a place of spiritual exploration, a place where we can come together to learn, to explore, to discuss, to pray, and to wrestle with difficult questions, supporting one another, and maybe not offering easy answers. This is a place where you don't have to believe X to belong in our community. There's no barrier to participation here. You're welcome no matter your marital status, race, background, sexual orientation, or gender identity, whether you believe in God or whether you believe in church or not. I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada, so I wear that set of lenses, uh, and I am thrilled, and it is my honor to host a community where all are truly welcome. Know that we use words like God in prayer here, but we mean them in the most expansive way possible, and we hold them with a wide and generous understanding. We like to say here that we aim to do brave space. We can't guarantee that this will be safe space. Anything spiritual is inherently vulnerable, and it is sticky and pinchy sometimes. And so we try to be brave, because we can't promise safety. That said, everything we do, we aim to be grounded in love. And so around here, we like to say that a little discomfort is probably a very good thing, but a lot is not. And so if anything here really shapes um, you're welcome to leave at any time or speak up and say, wait a minute, that's not right with me. This is a place of conversation, a place of discussion, where we are all taking place in uh, leadership and in wisdom sharing and in learning. Um, I happen to be the, the person who gets to do it for my dog, but uh, everybody here has a lot to teach me and one another. And I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, our our Truth and Reconciliation team is taking the service today, uh, and so some members have come prepared with different parts of teaching. Um, it was something that was in the works already because uh, Monday is National Indigenous Peoples Day here, um, but given recent events uh, and the uncovering of children's bodies at residential school sites across Canada, uh, we thought that this was a particularly poignant Sunday uh, to do some community-wide learning. I'm going to turn it over to Melissa for our land acknowledgement and learning. And Melissa, I'm going to have you look like you are so that I don't have to train. I'm going to train you to talk about Let's go. Greetings, everyone. I'm Melissa. I'm just gonna take a second. <laughs> Gail Kessler. My name is Melissa. I have lived on Comox First Nations land for the last 11 years. I was born in Stolo territory on Matsqui First Nation. And my family is mostly Germans. My dad's side has come over after the war, and my mother's side is a mix of French and German, and we're in the middle of digging. We've gone way back uh, to the early 1780s, something like that, so quite a, quite a few years back, and um, it's really great to understand and look at some of the stories and Try to wrap your head around where your ancestors came from and what lands you yourself have been on. I wanted to uh, just give you a bit of my background, do some introduction, and uh, acknowledge on behalf of us here today that we are so privileged and appreciative of the land of the Comox First Nations, which include the Pentlatch, the Satlut, the Satsitla, the Heihei and the Ikasim that are the traditional keepers of this land since time immemorial. Handy uh, 
trip this morning. I went to double check some of my pronunciation on the Comox First Nations website and it just happened to be updated and it's full of amazing information. So I would like to encourage you to go check it out. There's a, it's a rabbit hole. There's all information on treaty and culture and their history. So I just pulled a little bit directly from them and the people that now are the Comox First Nation. The Pampach were Coast Salish and they were not friends with Comox First Nation, which was the Satsila and Akasan. From what I understand, bear with me, I'm learning, I'm practicing saying these different names, but they they occupied the shores from Kelsey Bay, which was up by Sayward, north to Hornby and Denman, and that included the Puntledge River. Uh, they also lived in the Salmon River, the Salmon River, Quinsum, Campbell River, Quadra Island, High Bay, Comox Harbor, Estuary, and Bain Sound, and many others. So when the reservation was formed, the Pentlatch and the Comox people were put together, basically. And there's a lot of influence from the Kwakwala speaking people, which are also more up north through intermarriages and relations. Um, there are people that have always been rich with food, such as salmon, herring, deer, elk, berries, plants, which if you're rich in abundance of food, then you have a bit more time to embrace your culture. When you have these beautiful, huge timbers, you're able to use that for shelter and clothing. And um, so it's a very rich, Culture because there was time. Um, you, at the currently, some of you probably have noticed the fishing weirs on the Comox Road. What's that road called? At the estuary. I think you're right. It's 17. <laughs> <laughs> Dyke Road, we'll call it. Yeah. So when it's low tide, you can see the different fish weirs that they put back in, and they're working to restore the estuary. Um, and tying into the strong cultures, there's lots of art and masks, dances, and potlatch. And many of us have heard that the potlatches were banned for 50 years, 1915 to 1967, close. I wanted to mention that the Comox First Nation has been in treaty negotiations since 94. The website says that they are in their fifth stage and they are hoping to complete it in 2021, 22, the fiscal year. It looks really exciting. I didn't get a chance to dig into it, but it's a living agreement. So it's different than some of the earlier treaties and it's especially different than many of the treaties that were signed in the East. So I think this will be lots of new and exciting developments that we should offer support and uh, however we can. So I just wanted to give thanks and recognize that uh, the work that we have settlers and colonizers, that we need to challenge so much of what we know as regular. And um, I've heard in a few spaces and places from people that uh, the work of reconciliation is for the settlers to do, not for our indigenous friends to teach us. So it's time for us to step up and help. And that's why Ingrid talks about brave spaces. It's a bit scary to get up here, try and give a summary of the history of the people that have lived here. Don't screw up the uh, pronunciation, but practice is important. And the more we bring it up and explain to people where some of these um, reasons we're saying things, then it helps move it forward. When I was a, during school, I was taught that you should always introduce yourself, what land are you, what and whose land are you on, and who's your people, where are you from? And I like how Ingrid actually had the proper pronunciation of Bowen Island. I missed that part, but definitely a stolen nation that I grew up on. And our Kukwala speaking word for today is Kakukla. Kakukla. I'm probably not rolling my R super well. Kakutla, and it means learning. 
So thank you for joining us so far. And it's over to Ingrid. Thanks, Melissa. So I wanted to, before we uh, get too much further in, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of upcoming events uh, the, and an announcement. Um, the Weird Church is held under the very wide and expansive umbrella of the United Church of Canada. And uh, <laughs> they're the ones that gave us the funding to start Weird Church. Yay! Yay. And uh, the we have the, denomin the national denomination, and then we have the Pacific Mountain region of the United Church of Canada, which is BC, Yukon, and Banff. And at our AGM, which was last weekend, we voted to become a fully affirming region, which means that uh, we will be doing um, consultation practices and changing the structure of the way we do our governance. I know church governance, woo, but um, <laughs> at that at that level to become uh, fully inclusive of LGBTQ2 plus folks so that even in our structures and governance, we're fully inclusive and not just in the way we show up locally. So, yay. Uh, now, coming up this coming Saturday, we have our Weird Cafe, which is our monthly, uh, what is it? Arts? Just like farts, that's not right. <laughs> arts, hearts, and tunes, right? Arts, hearts, and tunes. When you were next to it, you said it was part of what we decided not to name it because it sounded like something else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad that made its way in. It made its way in regardless. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that we do every month is we get together local musicians to play some tunes. Uh, you'll see that the walls of the church are like an art gallery that are rotating through different local artists. And then we also raise money for uh, a great nonprofit in the area. And so um, this month we're going to be uh, directing donations towards the Indian Residential School Survivor Society. And it's the first one we can have in person. Uh, we'll also be streaming live to YouTube if you're uh, uncomfortable or not ready or that's your comfort place is to be in your home with your with your laptop. Uh, but if you do want to be here, we're limited to 50 people. And so if you want to make sure you get a spot, please register. Uh, Jen Forslund will be here. Alan Jessel will be here. Gregor and a couple of others. And so um, that's next Saturday at 730. July is Weird Church Sabbath time because we believe that fields should light fallow for a little bit every year. We also believe that I should. And so uh, we're going to take a little break for July, but we'll be back in full swing in August. Um, if you have a chance and a desire, you're welcome to throw some money in the basket by the door to help us uh, carry on with fantastic things like Wi Fi. And if you're online, uh, you can make a donation via our Canada Helps page or e-transfer. Oh, and the lovely and talented Jenna Sport is also running our camp program. Um, we do a camp program with Penelope Island. Our week is the week of August 23rd. Um, bursaries are available for anyone who needs them. There is no form to fill out. You just have to say, yes, I need this, and we magically receive it. And that is, yeah, the week of August 23rd through the 27th. And it is, the curriculum is based on the pride flag this year, so diversity and inclusion. Are there any community announcements? Sarah. Um, June 21st is National Indigenous Day, and hold that up. I'm going to bring that as an accessibility point to make sure everyone can hear, including those people online. June 21st is National Indigenous Day, and uh, due to the pandemic, it's a little different this year, but uh, the First Nation in front of the big house on Dyke Road, starting at 11 a.m. tomorrow, will have fried bread and bannock and seafood and Indian tacos and chili and some arts and crafts for sale until they're sold out. So if you're able to make it for lunch, I think it will be awesome and it's delicious. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, the t-shirts, the Weird Church t-shirts have been ordered. Okay. The Weird... Let me start that again. The t-shirts have been ordered. Um, and 
they should be here at probably by the end of July. And I think we might actually just do it out of our house, the pickup. Um, and Ingrid ordered extras. If you haven't ordered one yet, you can talk to Ingrid and buy one when they come in. Thank you. Okay, announcements are done. I want to invite you to take a nice big deep breath. Allowing ourselves to find a place of grounding, allowing ourselves to get centered. We're going to light this candle not as an invitation for divine love to join us because that spirit is always present to us, always available, but to help us uh, remember and pause and reflect. Today, I'm going to share a prayer with you written by uh, a collective of Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth in the United Church at the 2018 20th anniversary of the Apology from the Church to Survivors. Melissa and Lynn. 
Ninja and a few others who aren't with us today um, started out of a uh, interest from Liz Commander Brown, who was here in September and did some teaching for us on Indigenous justice and held a, a circle for us. And they challenged us to do better. They challenged us to live fully into uh, reconciliation, to live fully into rape relations, and to uh, work on decolonizing in ourselves as settlers. And we took that challenge really seriously. Um, we've been meeting monthly since November, and we've done book studies and workshops, and we came up with the phrase that guides us, which is uh, learning with humility, which is taking ownership for our own learning, and being rooted in relationship, which means taking our learning out the world. So this is an expression of, we've, since November, we've been doing a lot of decolonizing work, a lot of work within our team, a lot of learning and reading and getting it wrong and saying wrong things and learning how to pronounce things. And, uh, and this is our opportunity to share some of the things we've learned, some of the things that we think are important um, for us as a community. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah for the next little piece of our time together. And Uh, I come in a humble way to present these teachings, Gail Gessler. Um, I'm Sarah Jean Burrell, and I grew up in the territory of the Wiwakai and the Wiwakum, uh, First Nations or Campbell River in our English naming. I'm fifth generation settler to Turtle Island, with most of my relations still in the territories of the Micmac First Nation, or as we say, colonizer sing in Brunswick. Um, and as you can see, many of us on the TRC team today are wearing our orange shirts. And this day started in 2013, so actually not that long ago. And it's a legacy of the St. Joseph Mission Residential School commemorative project. And Orange Shirt Day is recognized every September 30th. Phyllis Jack Webstead, told her story for the first time in May of 2013 during the commemorative project and reunion in Williams Lake. And I'd like to share her story with you all now. You might need help with holding the book. Just getting a mic down. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you both. I think you don't need to do that one, so why don't I do She's really great at teaching children books <laughs> her other ministry. So when Phyllis was a little girl, she lived with her granny on the Dog Creek Reserve, part of the Strzetsum Excadum First Nation. Their home had no electricity and no indoor toilet. In the summer, when the sun was hot, Phyllis would cool herself off in the bathtub full of water that granny kept in her garden. Phyllis and Granny lived off the food they grew in Granny's garden and berries from the land. Phyllis and Granny would go to the Fraser River and catch fish. They would eat some fish for dinner and dry the rest on the drying racks to save for winter. They didn't have much, but they got by with what they had. When Phyllis turned six in July, Granny made her a cake to celebrate her birthday. Granny told Phyllis now that she was six, she was old enough to go to school. When September came, she would go to the residential school, St. Joseph's Mission, for the first time. Phyllis was excited about going to school so she could play with her cousins and the other children. She wanted to find out what happened there and hoped she'd make some friends.
before her first day at school, Granny took Phyllis into town to buy her a new shirt. They didn't have a car or a truck, so they went into town. They would take the blue bus and they called it the stage. Going to town was exciting. They took the stage down a noisy and bumpy dirt road. Soon the bumps stopped and the noise hushed. Phyllis looked out the window and saw a paved road whizzing by underneath them. After breakfast, Granny took Phyllis to a shop that was filled with clothes and toys. Phyllis picked out a shiny orange shirt that laced up the front. It was bright and exciting. She felt as excited about the shirt as she did about going to school. Granny bought the shirt and they got back on the stage and went home. Phyllis held the bag with her orange shirt in it all the way home. She promised that she wouldn't wear it until the big day when she went to school. Phyllis waited and waited, and finally the day arrived. Phyllis, wearing her shiny orange shirt, for the first time said goodbye to Granny, and Granny patted her on the head and said, what luck said. Phyllis got on the stage with all the other children and waved at Granny from the window. It was a two-hour journey to get to the residential school, which was much farther than Phyllis had ever traveled before. She stared out the window and waited for the place where they were going. When they arrived, Phyllis started to feel very scared. The residential school was so much taller than anything she'd ever seen before. The building seemed cold and unfriendly and unfriendly as the nurses who came out of the school to meet them. Phyllis asked her cousin how long they'd have to stay there. Her cousin said it would be 300 sleeps before they could go home, and that sounded like forever. The nuns took all the children inside and walked them down a long hallway in single file. In a room, the children were undressed and made to shower. Phyllis had never seen water coming under the walls before. Phyllis didn't want to take off her shiny orange shirts, but the sh shirt, but the nuns made her. After she'd showered, they gave her different clothes to wear and she didn't like them. The nurses put Phyllis in a chair and cut her hair short. She asked for her orange shirt back, but they told her that she wouldn't be allowed to wear it anymore. Phyllis cried and said, give it back. It's not yours, it's mine. My granny bought it for me, but no one would listen. The residential school wasn't where Phyllis learned. It was a place where the children slept and ate. Phyllis soon realized that the nuns didn't care if she was tired, sick, hungry, or sad. She had to rely on herself. She felt as though she didn't matter. At dinner time, Phyllis and the other children would eat tasteless, tasteless and almost colorless food. There were pale green moon-shaped beans that tasted awful, and there was smelly fish that definitely wasn't like the salmon she and Granny used to eat. At night, Phyllis wondered why Granny was not coming to get her. She would cry herself to sleep. In her dream, she would play in Granny's garden and go salmon fishing in the river. School, Phyllis learned to read and write with all the other boys and girls, but she still she was still really lonely. All the children from residential school were lonely because they'd been taken away from their homes and their families. Her teacher was a curly-haired redhead, and she was nice, and she smelled good. She would smile at Phyllis and help her with her lessons, and Phyllis wished she could go home with her teacher at the end of the day. Her teacher made school bearable. Phyllis liked her teacher, but she was no substitute for Granny. She wondered what Granny was doing while she was away, and she missed her home and her garden. She started counting the days until she could go back. Each day, the number got smaller, and she waited and waited. The other children at the school could order books from a book club, but none of the residential school children were allowed to get any. 
Phyllis didn't understand why they were treated differently. She wanted a book too. In the playground, she was just like all the other boys and girls. At lunchtime, everyone played together. Phyllis learned to swing on the swings and would wrap her swing around the pool and watch it on wine. On the bus, they learned to sing songs together. They sang, we are the mission, mighty, mighty missions. Everywhere we go, people want to know who we are. So we tell them, we are the mission, etc. <laughs> the season changed from fall to winter, then spring, and finally it was summer again. Phyllis was excited to go home. She never wanted to go back to the residential school or see those cold-hearted nuns ever again. After 300 sleeps, the stage came and took Phyllis back home to the reserve. She was so happy to be back in a place where she mattered, a place where people cared about her. That summer, she stayed at home with her granny. She stayed in her familiar house and worked with granny in the garden. She went fishing for salmon in the Fraser River and she ate them for dinner. She had everything she needed and she never went back to the residential school again. Not every child was as lucky as Phyllis, but Anna. We wear orange to honor the residential school survivors and remember that those remember those that did not survive. We honor their experiences and the experiences of their families. It's also an opportunity for First Nations, governments, schools, churches, and communities to come together in the spirit of reconciliation and hope for future generations of children. September 30th was picked because it was generally the time of year in which children were taken from their homes to residential schools. September was described by elders as the crying month. Locally in 2016, a member of the Comox First Nation and an incredible artist, Andy Everson, created a design as part of the ongoing campaign to build awareness that every child matters. You might have seen it around on some of the Facebook posts, it's the hands all the way around every child matters in the middle. I have a picture on my phone. I was going to show up to the camera, but I left my phone at my seat. I don't want Dee to notice I'm gone. <laughs> um, recently, this design was being used without his permission, and lots of people were asking, and so, um, and some companies were trying to use it for profit, and so I made a statement and shared it on social media that the design can be used by art, uh, with artist credit given, and that a large portion of the money made for the sale must be given to a nonprofit Indigenous society. This statement is powerful and it's done in a good way and it's, I think it's really cool that Andy's art is going around the world. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I'm gonna turn it over to Linda who's prepared a little bit about uh, the Indian Act, which is what has and continues to govern uh, Indigenous bodies. In this Most of the information that I'm going to give to you today comes from this book, 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. It was written by Bob Joseph. Bob Joseph is a member of the Wawatnuk Nation and is a hereditary chief of the Gayaksala clan. Joseph grew up in Campbell River, BC and lives in Qualicum Beach, BC. He is an author and indigenous relations trainer. His book, 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act, was the 10th best-selling Canadian book of 2019 and the sixth best-selling of 2020. He has been an associate professor at Royal Roads University and a guest lecturer at other academic institutions. The Indian Act developed over time through several separate pieces of colonial legislation regarding Aboriginal peoples across Canada. 
It is a history of oppression and resistance. The Bagot Commission Report, 1842 to 1844, provided the framework for the Indian Act in 1876. It was presented to the Legislative Assembly. It proposes that separating Indigenous children from their parents is the best way to assimilate them into Euro-Canadian culture. The Gradual Civilization Act, the British North America Act, later titled the Constitution Act of 1967, granted the federal government exclusive jurisdiction over Indians and land reserved for Indians. This quote comes from the annual report of the Department of the Interior in 1876. Our, our legislation generally rests on the principle that the Aborigines are to be kept in a condition of tutelage and treated as wards or children of the state. The true interests of the Aborigines and of the state alike require that every effort should be made to aid the red man in lifting himself out of his condition of tutelage and dependence. And that is clearly our wisdom and our duty through education and every other means to prepare him, the red man, for a higher civilization by encouraging him to assume the privileges and responsibilities of full citizenship. John A. MacDonald in 1887 said, the great aim of our legislation has been to do away with the tribal system and assimilate the Indian people in all respects with the other inhabitants of the dominion as speedily as they are fit to change. Duncan Campbell Scott, Deputy Superintendent of General of Indian Affairs wrote, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Our objective is to continue until there is not an Indian that has not been absorbed into the body politic and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. The Assembly of First Nations has characterized the Indian Act as a form of apartheid and human rights abuses. The whole, the whole Indian Act is so arrogant, the arrogance that the colonists and settlers had that their way of life was so superior to what the Aboriginal culture was and they wanted to extinguish that culture. And yet, from my perspective at this point in time, I really believe that the Indian culture was far superior to the colonial culture. They, uh, they wanted to turn them into hard-working farmers, and that was, and, and the thing of shared, shared everything that was part of the Aboriginal culture was very foreign to the settlers, the settlers believed in private property and wanted the Aboriginals to believe in private property. So I'm going to read to you the, ten, the uh, 21 things. It, the Indian Act of 1876 imposed the electric chief, elected chief and band council system. In 1869, it continues to the present day. The denied women's status from 1869 to 1985. It created reserves, 1876, to the present day. Encouraged voluntary and enforced fran enfranchisement, 1876 to 1985. It could expropriate portions of reserves for public works, and it gave the example of the Kitsilano Reserve. In, from 18, in 1869, 1877, 1901, 1904, 1911, 1913, 1916, 1930, 1934, 1942. They sublet portions of the Kitsilano Reserve to anybody who had the money to take a portion of it. And in 1947, between 1947 and 1965, they broke the reserve into parcels and sold it. 1977 to 2002, the Squamish Nation 
the Musqueam Indian Band, and the Salile Wautooth Nation launched legal actions and are receiving some recompense for those, uh, for that land grab. The sixth thing, they renamed individuals with European names from 1880 to undetermined time. The, the undetermined time in 1951, there was there were some major amendments made to the Indian Act, but all of the undetermined times, some of the things ended in 1951 and some did not. The Act created a permit system to control Indians' abilities to sell farm products from 1881 to 2014. The uh, colonists wanted them to um, to be productive farmers working all day long, every day, but they couldn't sell the products of their work. It prohibited the sale of ammunition to Indians, 1882 to undetermined time. Pro prohibited the sale of intoxicants to Indians, 1884 to undetermined time. Declared potlatch and other cultural ceremonies illegal, 1884, to 1951. Restricted Indians from leaving their reserve without permission from an Indian agent, 1885 to 1951. Created residential schools. This was first discussed in the 1840s and residential schools were in effect from 1886 to 1996. Forbade Indian students from speaking their home language late 1880s to early 1960s. Forbade Western Indians from appearing in any public dance, show, exhibition, stampede, or pageant wearing traditional regalia from 1906 to 1951. Uncultivated reserved lands were leased to non-Indians from 1918 to 1985. The act forbade Indians from from forming political organizations, 1927 to 1951. Prohibited anyone, Indian or non-Indian, from soliciting funds for Indians to hire legal counsel. Prohibited pool hall owners from allowing Indians entrance, 1927 to undetermined time. That one went out in 1951 with the amendment. Forbade Indian students from practicing their traditional religion, 1940s. Denied Indians the right to vote until 1960, despite the fact that there were Indian soldiers in both World War I and World War II, and their work in the war was exemplary and wonderful. Then the last thing, the 21st thing, the Indian Act is a piece of legislation created under colonial rule for the purpose of subjugating a group of people. Subjugate, definition, bring a country, people, etc., into subjection or conquer. And second definition is bring under domination or control, make subservient or dependent. So that was the Indian Act and what it was about. In the book, uh, 21 Things You Ought to Know, it's also got 94 calls from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It also has a list of 21 things we can do as individuals to support reconciliation. So I urge you to get a copy of the book. It's a $20 book and well worth the investment. Thank you. And uh, as it was mentioned, that's a current piece of legislation. And that is not history, that is present. So, one of the other things that I think is important to highlight, uh, especially of your church, is as I mentioned, we're part of the United Church of Canada. And so, uh, just like all of us who are identified as Canadian citizens, anyone who is participating in any part of the United Church 
I don't know the history. And so uh, between 1849 and 1969, the United Church of Canada ran 15 residential schools uh, out of the 130 that were running in Canada. Five of them were in BC. So the United Church withdrew from participation in the program in 1969 and in 1988 issued an apology for its role in colonization. The apology was received and it was acknowledged. In 1998, the church apologized for its role in the residential school system and pled guilty to uh, the claims that came about uh, before the TRC. So the, the United Church pled guilty to their role and waived uh, the right to insurance. The church then entered into the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, which included financial compensation for survivors and the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. At the national denomination, uh, the National Healing Fund was established, focusing on supporting projects of language revitalization, cultural restoration, and healing. After the TRC, the church had been working on implementing the calls to action, including the call to action number 48, uh, which means implementing the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, uh, and allowing that to be the framework for the denominational institutional reconciliation. And in 2019, the denomination did a complete restructuring. Uh, and one of those reasons was to live fully into that agreement so that the Indigenous Church that exists within the United Church of Canada could be fully self-defining, so fully self-determining, and would be able to identify how, when, if, and in what way um, uh, the Indigenous Church interacts with the denomination. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of the history within the United Church. Uh, in the present, I mentioned just the other, um, just at the beginning of the service, that last weekend was our AGM, and so that's for the BC, Yukon, and Banff area, and uh, the, the, a huge leap forward was approved. So uh, the school that was the United Church School on Vancouver Island was Alberni Valley, uh, Alberni Indian Residential School, and Alberni Valley United Church is there, and for the last 10 years, uh, the folks from that community um, have been working with the Kukacheset and Seishat Nation, which are the nations that are present there, um, to find a way forward in reconciliation together. And so we just voted and approved uh, with 97% approval um, that the United Church would pay for the ground search, the potential exhumation and identification of anyone found to offer Indigenous and non-Indigenous methods of counseling and healing for those engaged in the on-the-ground work and set aside at, at least a million dollars to build, to begin construction on a healing uh, healing centre that would be on where the previous residential school uh, was located. So the proposal also compels the National Church to do the same thing at all 15 sites that we had a hand in uh, in uh, administering throughout the country and, and uh, also uh, <laughs> compelling other churches to do the same at a national level. So we are continuing here at Weird Church to try to do this work day by day, bit by bit, fighting our own colonial imperatives to want to do things faster and take more action, but to go slow, to work on our own thinking processes, uh, to do the book studies, to do the education, um, and to do the work that allows, um, that takes the, the burden of education and information off of Indigenous peoples and, and replaces it on settler folks. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've engaged with Project Unpaid Paradise at Kusikusam, uh, donated some money to that, and uh, we've uh, also signed up to do volunteer hours once the actual work begins, which is very, very soon. I just heard. So, um, that is a lot of things that we just told you. It's a lot of things, and it's a lot of heavy things. Maybe some of this has been news to you. Maybe none of it has been. Maybe it has been difficult. That's kind of the point. 
part of what we need to, part of what we are called to do as uh, folks within an organization that is the church, and with for folks who walk across the land as settlers and colonizers in our historical backgrounds, is to continue to be uncomfortable, is to continue to listen, to continue to hear, and to continue to show up time and time again. So I thank you for your willingness to show up and to listen and to be present. And I invite you to carry on your own learning. And uh, Linda and Jenna have a song that they put together to share at this time. And then after they're done, we will head into our uh, shared prayer time in the service. But first, Linda and Jenna. Shall we know by the company we keep by the ones who circle around to tend these flowers? We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time. Oh God, 
you have put in us hearts that love beyond understanding. You have put in us hearts that have great ability to grieve. We pray that you would help us to hold a wide space for all that we bring, for all that we are, helping us to let go of the bumps of the past and embrace the newness of today. We give you thanks for this community where we can come as we are, tired, worn down, defeated, exuberant, joyful, over the top, and everywhere in between. Hear the prayers of our collective community. We're going to start our prayers by lighting a candle for all those who never came home like Phyllis did, and the family and friends who continue to grieve. Ryan and Estelle, everything has challenges. Amanda and Jonathan. Thanks that the Tamil family, incarcerated on Christmas Island for over two years, has been allowed to live in Perth, Western Australia, on a special visa. Pray that they will be allowed to resettle in the small Queensland town that was their home for a number of, know, number of years. federal government to pass under. For all the people who are incarcerated in the prison camps. All the dads that are here and not here, and for all the dads that on the road to fetch it. And then a candle too for around the world whose countries are still caught in the grips of this third wave where COVID cases continue to rise in some places with no end in sight. So John, you and Mark, who are three days over the view of the baby, for that other pandemic we are facing, addiction, overdose, pray for 
for those who have found recovery, celebrate with them. We pray for those who have yet to find it. up all of these prayers that were spoken, all the ones that remained in the silence of our hearts. And we pray this prayer. Great and heavenly spirit, God of compassion, healing, and comfort, we lift up in prayer the sacred lives of the children some now known to us, all known to you, who died in residential schools. We lift up in prayer the sacred lives of the children who went missing from these schools and whose fates are unknown to those who held them most dear. We grieve the loss of so many thousands of these little ones, and we grieve especially for their loss so far. We grieve the loss of youth with so much potential. These were children of displaced children of our land. The loss of their giftedness is our collective loss. We lament how long our families have had to live with unanswered questions. Hear our prayers for those who are not informed of their children's deaths at all or on a timely basis. Hear our prayers for those who are not told of where their daughters and sons have been buried. Hear our prayers for those who have long hoped that a child who went missing somehow survived and had a good life, even as they may have also feared the worst. We lament our complicity in the loss of these children. As members of a church who ran residential schools, we seek your help to look as we look to redress the many ways in which our church failed these indigenous children and families in our communities. We pray that your reconciling love will teach us how to create true bonds of community and understanding as indigenous and non-indigenous peoples today. We lift up with gratitude the efforts of all those who are seeking to honor the lives of the children who died as well as the children whose fates are unknown ongoing research and active remembrance. We ask for your continued guidance of them as they work to uncover the stories of the lost. We understand how precious this information is and how vital it is to the healing of so many families and communities. We ask that you bless those who are preparing to honor the children with sacred ceremonies and those who work to protect burial sites in keeping with the traditions of Indigenous peoples across this land. We pray for the families of these children and for all who love them. Envelop them in the warmth of your infinite care and give them peace. Inspire all of us with energy, wisdom, and commitment to the loving pursuit of the truth which will heal all of us in our brokenness and lead to reconciliation with our neighbors. this is hitting you hard, whether you're online or here in the building with us, don't go away. We're going to hold this space open for as long as we need to for grief, processing, lament, silence, whatever you need, there is room here for it. So Centering Prayer will not continue as normal at 5.30 as it would today. This will just be a held space. If you are feeling compelled to action, our next book study is 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act, and you're welcome to sign up for the Truth and Reconciliation team. You don't have to be a member here to partake in that team. 
we've been meeting online, and so if you are far away, you can always join us online. We're gonna have one more song from Linda and Jenna before we before we close this part of the service, and I will offer an Anishinaabe blessing that was gifted to me that was gifted to you. we may heal the earth and heal each other. 